All right, so hopefully that was a good break. Now, as we return, we're going to be taking a look at some new mobile games. Uh, the first of which is the Jazz Jackrabbit game that is included with the UDK. Now, if you didn't know you had this, you can find this under your file, open, and it's under your mobile game. So if you found the Epic Citadel map, you can find this one too. It's called Jazz Minigame. We'll go ahead and open that up. Now, before we really take a terribly deep look at it, I do have a few things to say about it. So, again, a million apologies for subjecting you to PowerPoint again. But, so obviously, if you haven't seen this, this is a mobile top-down 3D shooter. And there's a lot of these on the App Store. There's a lot of these for Android as well, where you kind of use one thumb to move your character around, another one to make them shoot in some direction. Uh, this is based off the old Jazz Jackrabbit game, which hopefully you're at least passingly familiar with if you haven't just played the daylight out of it. Uh, obviously, it's included. All of the gameplay is handled via Kismet, which, in, uh, to me, this makes it one of my favorite things ever, because I love the idea that an entire game was made within Kismet. It is best experienced via the UDK Remote app, uh, though you can play it uh, on your PC with you know, some control. The enemies are crowd agents. This is actually really cool. The crowd system is being deployed for a really limited form of AI. And conceptually what it is, is uh, if you're unfamiliar with a crowd, it's really just a, a dumb fire and forget style of AI where you spawn some kind of a baddie and they just wander around on a navigation mesh toward a goal. That's all they do. They can navigate around obstacles that are inherent in the mesh, but they're always moving toward the goal. So what was done for this game is we set that up with spawn points where uh, all of the, uh, the crowds are going to be spawned. And then their goal is literally attached to your main character. So that means all the bad guys are just always trying to seek you out so they can get close and, and bite you or uh, spit at you and things like that. Now this entire game, uh, well, the simple AI attacks based on proximity. I do want to mention this entire game was made by Shane Cottle. Uh, who's our principal artist here at Epic. Amazing guy, super talented. And I guess without any further ado, let's have a look at the game. So here's the arena, as it were. So it's very cool, very cutesy, and, and colorful. Uh, there's some interesting stuff going on here that I do want to kind of point out, though. So all throughout the map, you'll see these little crowd spawners. These are what are going to literally spawn the bad guys. And these are in locked positions throughout the world. However, you'll notice that I, as I click on each one, you get this little yellow vector line that draws back to our main character. And that's because there is literally a target goal for that crowd object to follow. And that's attached to our character, as I was saying earlier. They're just going to constantly hunt him down. Now, if we take a look under Show. Now, uh, if, if you're totally unfamiliar with the interface, let me point this out. So at the top of your viewport, there's a little black uh, drop down arrow. Click on that, go to show and make sure you show paths and you can see the navigation mesh. Now later on we're gonna have to create one of these for the MOBA game so you'll see a little bit more about how these work but these are the main way in which these uh, crowd bad guys are going to navigate through the world. Uh, they won't go into any of the red areas, those are like walls, those stop them, but they can go anywhere on the green mesh. So very nice way to uh, allow the baddies to navigate. Now, I should go ahead and show you this, but before I do, I have something else I want to show off. And that is UDK Remote. If you don't have it yet and you want to make a mobile game, you should get it. Uh, it is completely free over on the App Store. This is what it looks like, and I'll just try to... That's pretty close. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just kind of a blank screen. It's aware of when you touch the screen. You can see maybe there's a little tiny blue circle around my finger. And what it does is it, get, it allows you to take your iOS device and essentially make it into a controller. Now again, getting this set up at your house, uh, may t it's real easy to set up. The only difficulties you may run into are if your router blocks the port uh, that it's operating off of. There are instructions on setting this up on UDN. If you get over on the UDN and you uh, search for UDK Remote, you should find it fairly quickly. Uh, make sure if you don't know how to operate your router and forward a port on it, you go to a I'm 99% sure that's portforwarding.com or some website like that, and it'll walk you through the process. I had to do that at my house. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this out with the mobile previewer. And if you can see me at the same time, and you can see the screen, so I'm actually using UDK Remote, and I'm running around. So let's see, hang on, I'm really bad at this. 
So here come the baddies. Now, you're going to notice a couple of things straight out of the gate. The enemies are not super smart. They're not really intended to be. The crowd system is really for very simplified AI. Really, really basic stuff. But it's nice to have. And as I, I wiggle my right stick, we're shooting. And there you go. There's just like a quick rundown of how this game works. Now, this is, as I mentioned earlier, done entirely within Kismet, which I had minimized and not closed. So if you ever hit the Kismet button and you suddenly don't see Kismet, always look in some corner of one of your many monitors, because I'm sure you all have many, and, uh, and find where you put your window, because I do that all the time. So when you make an entire game for you know, out of Kismet, you will often find that your Kismet sequence looks a little intimidating. So if you need to grab a cup of coffee and sit down and go over this, you know, grab one. However, we're not going to go over the whole thing. Really, the big thing I want to focus on here, because I think this would be more fun for you to sit down and kind of pick apart on your own, is just kind of how the enemies are handled. So if we take a look, let me kind of jump over here. We have a start gameplay event. And that triggers each one of these sequences. And there's some really good commenting here to kind of help you figure out the flow. So we have a mobile crowd spawner. And you'll see that has some spawn points. Now, as soon as a crowd unit is spawned, he's immediately going to try to track his way toward your main character. And that's because your character literally has the goal taped to his back like a kick me sign. Now, we are what we're doing at this point is once we get to a certain proximity, we are essentially spitting at the bad guy. Oh, I'm sorry. We're spitting at, uh, at Jazz. So uh, that's the, the snake-like creatures. They have a little green spit wad that they'll try to fire off at Jazz. And then if you do enough damage to them, they can die. And you'll see there's a lot of logic to make all of this happen. It can be picked apart. If it's a little intimidating, the first go through you get don't stress it. Keep it simple. Uh, if you actually wanted to create something like this on your own, again, I would stage it, uh, kind of stair-step it, like what we did with uh, the interactive gate at, uh, at, during the Epic Citadel. I would start off with just make a crowd spawner. And then I would make that spawner go to a static location. And then I would see about attaching that static location to my little character and make that move around, make stuff head toward him. Then I would try to control when they spawn. Then I would start worrying about, OK, what happens when they go to proximity? Maybe the first thing you do is make a network that just says, all right, when they get within 200 units, I want you to log to the screen. Ah! And you can spell that however you want to. So you know you start like that, and you build, you layer up your effects until you get something you want. Then, when you're done creating all of that in Kismet, you show this to a programmer who scoffs at you, who ridicules you for putting all this work into this much visual scripting, and probably condenses it all down to just a few Unreal scripts. But that's what programmers are for. And me, I'm more of an artist. So I think this is pretty awesome. So definitely, if you're trying to get into uh, conceptualizing gameplay through Kismet, this is an excellent example to pick apart. There's all kinds of useful stuff here. Uh, for instance, we have, there's an entire pickup system. So we spawn pickup, and you'll notice we've got a random switch here. So it's going to randomly choose one of these three things to do. So up here at the top, we are going to spawn the alternate weapon, which makes your, uh, your gun shoot a whole lot faster. And we, we ask a few questions. We say, is it already available? Because you know, if it is, then we want to spawn something else. And you'll see how that wraps back around. So it's kind of like saying, hey, this pickup is already in play, and so we don't want to spawn another one, so pick something else and spawn that instead. And then we simply go through here, we teleport this to the appropriate location, we play some noises, and then we are setting some values. And some of these values we can actually muck with to change the game already. So let's see, we've got game mode, we've got weapon mode, we've got mode one rate and mode two rate. Mode 2 rate is how fast your gun is going to fire when you get the super gun. And so that's uh, one round every 0.1 seconds. So the, what is that? That's like 10 times a second. Where here, it's four times a second, so it's pretty slow. So if you just want to start playing with stuff and you're bored, you could take the mode 1 rate and set it to something like 0.05, which is like 20 times a second. And then, you hang on, we get uh, UDK remote fired back up which, if you've already let it go to the lock screen, sometimes it closes, at least with the newer iOS. Don't let that alarm you. And we fire the mobile previewer back up. And really, this is just showing off that you can also make edits to gameplay right here inside of Kismet. Yep, there you go. And now I've got a better gun. 
as you can see. Now this is more like the kind of gun that I need to play this game with because, as you guys saw earlier, I'm pretty horrible. So this is almost like just swinging around a fire hose of doom. Okay, so enough of that. I can get carried away and sit there and play games for you guys for a while, and this is not that kind of a Twitch stream. Okay, so that is a quick look at the Jazz Jackrabbit game. Uh, I know we didn't spend as much time with that as we did with Epic Citadel, but we're not here to make a whole bunch of changes to this one. This is already a game, and so I don't have to really go out of my way to make it uh, significantly more interactive. Now, I have some other games I want to look at, too, to show you some of the variety that is possible within UDK. But these examples are not... Uh, they're not included with UDK. You have to go over to the UDN to get them, and so I wanted to show you that especially. If you go to UDN, and I mentioned this uh, web address earlier, you can go to epicgames.com slash three slash developmentkitgems.html, and remember your casing, because it is kind of picky about it, and along with all of the gems here, and please, if you're new to UDK, I implore you, spend some time to go through each and every one of these. Study them all, because there are so many beautiful techniques and wonderful tricks and tips that you just didn't know existed. But at the very top, we have some starter kits. So the first one we're going to take a look at is the Racer Starter Kit, which we'll just take a look at it from here real quick. So this is a mobile racing game. It's a track that is based on Epic Citadel. This is actually put together by James Tan, just to give him some props. James is awesome. And uh, so you can download this from, as I mentioned earlier, uh, epicgames.com, three development kits. This is not a full game. As a matter of fact, the first time you try it, you'll notice there are a few things that visually are not even working maybe completely properly. But 99% of what you need to, to make a racing game is already there. Nobody is anticipating you to just take this and release it as a game. So when you see like little artifacts or stuff looks weird, don't think about that, because ideally, you're using this as a launch pad, and the game that you make looks entirely different. It has its own vehicles, has its own environments, uh, has you know, that, that really cool chick who comes out and stands between the cars with the flags, and I just probably put my hands up too high. And um, so, anyway, so uh, let's go ahead and continue. This is best also experienced with the UDK remote app, but you can play it with a mouse and keyboard. Now, a few things about it before we take a look. There is some Unreal script. Uh, taking place here. The basic car and the wheel setup, those all required physics. So you don't want to have to do that kind of thing uh, at Kismet because it's a little too high level. So the, the basic car setup is all done inside of Unreal Script. There were some custom Kismet nodes that were actually created via Unreal Script. So literally using Unreal Script to make a node that would work in Kismet. Uh, one is a string concatenate node, and what that does is that takes a group of, of strings or just alphanumeric characters, and it starts attaching them together to make a final message. So if you need to say, you know, you win, your time was 5 minutes 32 seconds, and it took you that long to make a lap because you're terrible, uh, you could string all of that together, especially the terrible bit, and you can report that back to the user. The teleport one is, uh, you've seen this on probably a, a million racing games, where, you know, if, you, if you're obnoxious like me and you think, who needs a track anyway? I'm going to go this way. And uh, you end up driving off a ravine, it will automatically teleport you back onto your last uh, navigation point on the track, which we'll take a look at in a second. Or you can manually fire it off in case you get lost on a linear track and forget where you are. So then in Kismet, we have some other cool stuff, too, we're going to be taking a look at. So uh, this is where all the track signs are set up. So this is kind of like a rally game where, you know, you get, like, the, you know, turn left, turn right, and stuff like that. Uh, there's scoring all taking place in Kismet, and there's an end game scenario all fired off inside of Kismet. So now let's jump out of here. Let's jump back over to UDK, and let's open this up. Now, ooh, before I open, not to get, you know, too terribly derailed, but I want to point this out. If you want to actually use this, it will take a couple of minutes of your time. You need to go to uh, the address we mentioned earlier, so 3 Development Kit Gems Racer Starter Kit. You'll just follow the link to it. So once you get to the Development Kit Gems, click on Racer Starter Kit. At the very bottom is your download to get this starter kit. You can download it. It works with the latest version. I'm running the, the latest build of UDK right now, which is the July build, if memory serves. And uh, the starter kit works well for it. To get it running, you need to follow these directions. There are a lot of pictures with these directions. That's because the directions were made for people like me, who don't think we need directions. 
please read these and don't think you can skip them. It's actually a pretty easy process, so I don't want to intimidate you or anything. Uh, there's a breakdown of how the Kismet works if you want to kind of go over that. We'll be taking a look at some of that here in just a minute. But the actual setup process you do need to know about. So uh, where to extract them, how to get them copied in. This is the important thing, is you're going to be going into your default engine any file, and you have to add a, a, a specific line to the edit packages. And it tells you that line. It even types it out. So if you want to copy paste it, do that. There's no excuse to get this wrong. And then you'll fire up Unreal front end, and you'll do a full recompile of your scripts. So hopefully you, haven't ha you don't have any you know, previously broken scripts that you've been working on. Once everything is compiled, you'll be able to jump in here open up a level. Let's go to uh, content, and you'll see starter racer game content. You can open up the map. Uh, we don't need to save this because we didn't do anything important. And here we are. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up in the mobile previewer. Do, 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 do. And three, two, one. I missed that. OK, so this can be played with a mouse and keyboard with WSAD. You'll notice that we spit up some particles uh, off the wheels, which don't look amazing. Again, remember, starter kit. The fact is, we've already got it set up to spit particles out from under your wheels. So that's convenient. Easy late. Now, I do want to mention that there is sound included here. And if you're playing this at home, you can uh, hear the, uh, the dulcet tones of medium James right. Tan actually telling you things like medium right, medium Easy left, and, and things like that, which is very handy. Now, I'm going to go ahead and jump out of here. I'm not going to play all the way through. You guys do not need to see how badly I suck at this game. I do want to point this out. So here's the map, right? So what we did is uh, we've got Epic Citadel turned into a racing track. And here's where we start, all the way back out here. You're going to see these navigation paths all throughout the track. These are very useful. And if we show paths, so go back to our drop down. Of course, you can just hit P. They do link you all the way through the track, but they serve another purpose. If we open up Kismet, you'll see there's actually a lot of track-based stuff going on here inside of Kismet. And this has also been broken up into a series of sub-networks or sub-sequences. So here's our highest level stuff. So at the beginning of the, of the map, we start playing the animations for the flags to start wavering. So that's uh, obviously not physics-based. That's some skeletal mesh animation we've got going. Uh, we've got a gate animation that plays when you get close to a gate. So it, it rolls up, which I'll show you. I'll, I'll actually play through this here toward the end. Uh, we've got some reset options that will uh, reset the, the car back to its original position. But the important stuff is all broken up into these subsequences. That's what these funny looking nodes are that don't have any inputs or outputs. So for instance, if we take the track signs and we open that up, here's how all of the track signs are working. You'll see we have various triggers throughout the level. So there's, for instance, trigger 13, trigger 7. And what these do is they check and see what's already being drawn. And then they make sure to draw the appropriate sign. Or what they're doing is they're taking a value and setting it to true. There's actually al already something in the background which is saying, hey, draw something. And uh, anything that is set to true gets drawn. So in this case, we're drawing a left turn sign. And these triggers are all sitting right before all of the major left-hand turns so that the appropriate sign will pop up. Then there's a delay, and then it disappears. So pretty straightforward, but it is nice how it's broken up into all of these subsequences so that you know like if, if your track signs aren't working properly, you know exactly where to go to get that sorted. Uh, if for some reason the HUD is looking strange or not doing as expected, you can jump into the HUD rendering path, and you can see everything that is taking place here as well. So a very neat thing to break down. Of course, it's also a nice mix of Unreal Script as well as Kismet to, to show you how you can create a game while uh, working on both of those. If for some reason you wanted to see the scripts themselves, once you get this installed, uh, if you go to your UDK installation, you can go under Development, jump under Source, and you should see the Starter Racer Game folder. And then there's a Classes folder inside of that. And here are all of the scripts. You can actually open these up inside of something like Notepad++, and you can see how these were set. And use these not only as a way to help you get started making your own racing game, but you can modify this. You can make your own variants of it. So you could have you know, like hover vehicle, which you know, descends from vehicle and has its own characteristics, et cetera, and so forth. OK, so 
that is a quick look at Racer. And just because I said I would, let's take an actual look at the game itself. If you're trying this on your end, there's music and stuff. You guys aren't hearing any music, which is actually a good thing. Easy lift. So, come around the corners. Now, okay, I have these W and A. I'm trying to steer by dragging the mouse, and it, I don't know, I think I'm horrible at that. So here you can see there's a couple of unfinished rocks. Again, remember, starter kit. Hey, I'm sure that hot really rock is intentional. I have one just like in my yard. That one too. Really. I just want to get to the gate. Can I make it through the gate without crashing? You think? You think? Maybe? No? Oh, barely. Okay. Easy late. It's actually a pretty cool track. Thank you. I've driven off this so many times now. Okay. Can I make it? Threading the needle. Okay. Not falling off. Headed to the castle. I think that's the port colors we opened in the last demo. It would have been cool if we'd have stepped out through the gate and a scorpion would have run us over. Alright, and then we gotta come way late here yeah, and trying not to hit walls and turning in courtyard. Way late. And wait, I don't know where I am anymore. Oh wait, no, the, the finish is actually right behind me. Yeah. So, boom, and there you go. It gives you a final score and you, know, you can see the end. So really what it is, again, is a way for you to get started seeing how to make your own racing game. It's not in any way intended to be even remotely like a finished game. It's just a launch pad to help you get going. So that's a look at the Epic Racer. Now this next one's actually pretty cool. This is actually, this is my favorite one, and I try not to sound too terribly biased about it. This is also done by James Tan. This is the MOBA starter kit. So for all of my League of Legends and Dota friends and Smite friends, and uh, there's so many MOBAs these days that I can't keep track of them all, but, uh, oh, actually, I listed some off right here to, to make things easier on myself. So any of the ones you see listed on your screen, and I'm sure many, many others, uh, you can do that, and you can uh, make these in your own style. Now, this is powered entirely by Unreal Script. There's no kismet going on to make all of this happen. Uh, now, this includes the support for all the major MOBA features that you would want. So we've got heroes, we've got creeps, we've got tower shops, items, abilities, leveling, all kinds of other stuff, and it's already there. You don't have to worry about, well, how do I write code to make my character level, or how do I write a shop system, or how do I write items? The items are even combinable. So you can sort of, you know, attach your I don't remember how it works. As I attach your sword to your shield and make a sword shield, because that's awesome. Or you have the power to do that. And it's iPad ready, uh, but I'm not going to uh, actually be deploying it today. I do want to show you, though, on my desktop, I suppose. Let's open up the map for it. I'm going to show you uh, the actual map that comes along with it, but then I got something else I want to kind of show off as well. So to get to this, once you've got it installed, and this installs just like the racer, so. Let me back up. If we go back over to the gems, so I'm back over on UDK, so here's the, the racing game we were looking at a minute ago. Let's go back over to the Unreal Development Kit gems. You'll see the MOBA starter kit. Now, this has a lot of information about how everything works, and it's a really good read. If you want to make uh, your own MOBA, you should read all of this. I do want to kind of point out, though, that uh, the how to use the starter kit basically includes the download instructions and how to get it set up. It's just exactly like the racer. You know, grab the packages, copy them to the appropriate folder. Once they're all copied, you'll do a full recompile of the code and everything just works. And there's the download link right there. However, what I'm going to do is show you what you need to know in order to create your own MOBA compatible map. Because there's one that comes with it, which we can see here. I'm going to fly way up above it so we can see the arena. So there's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like in game mode. Pretty awesome. Let's play this right here inside the viewport. I won't worry about the mobile previewer. We'll do this just for uh, speed and prettiness sake. So at the beginning, we can choose a hero. There's only two, because this is just a simple starter kit. Choose between Demo Guy and Cathode the robot. And we have WSAD controls to move the camera. We can right click to move the character around. Uh, we've got creeps who are already taking off and heading down the, the single lane of our map. And they're going to collide with the enemy creeps. And they'll all start fighting. Of course, I can help them with my awesomeness, and I'm getting money for helping. And then 
There's our first tower, and the tower's gonna start taking out my creeps. So all of this is already included, but it gets even better. So check this out. Uh, I'm gonna initiate a cheat code, which, no, you, it's too bad you can't do this on League of Legends. I might actually be good at this game. So uh, give XP. I don't condone cheating at all, really. So uh, let's see, let's do 100,000 XP. Awesome. Now, so this is just for kind of debugging, obviously, right? Uh, so I've leveled up 44 times. So I have abilities that can all be leveled. I have creeps that can kill me, and I should run away from them. So let's get back over here. So uh, let's just go ahead, and I'll level up all my abilities. So you can see that all of my abilities are changing and getting more powerful. I haven't even shown you what those abilities are, but that's OK. We'll get to that in a minute. And if everything is maxed out, I can just start dumping my additional levels into my stats to start making myself ridiculously powerful, which I'm just going to spam the left mouse button until I am just embarrassingly overpowered. OK, cool. So now let's continue. And what poor unfortunate creep is going to face me now? OK, now let's do, I've got an area of effect. I've got a little shield option, so that's kind of protecting me right now. So I've got all kinds of abilities. And let's just go attack this tower. Die, tower! Yeah, I'm way OP'd right now. This is ridiculous. But it does show that there's a lot of stuff going on, right? Oh, and there's also, and let me fire it back up for just one second. There's, <laughs> but wait, there's more. Uh, back here at the very beginning, we are inside the shop. So notice when I'm at the top of these stairs, my little shop icon turns yellow. And so I can shop, I can buy stuff. So I think I can also give myself some gold. Yeah, give money. And we'll give ourselves a whole lot of money. And so here in the shop, I can actually buy items. And those go straight to me. Uh, if I want to, if I move away, I can buy them again. You'll see they go into my stash, just like you know, many you know, popular MOBA games. And then I can get them out of the stash if I want to. So definitely a lot of cool features, stuff that is very useful for making your own MOBA. Now, the trick is it's not super apparent, or it's not just exactly handed to you how to go ahead and use this to make your own maps. So that's what I want to do here. I want to walk you through what you need to know to make a very basic MOBA map using this starter kit, because there's more going on here uh, than meets the eye at first. All right. Forget I said anything. Uh, so let's go ahead and hit new. Let's. Uh, I'm just gonna create a brand new map, and uh, this will be night lighting for no other reason than I think it's cool. Okay. So for starters, what we're gonna do? We're gonna keep this really, really simple. I'd like my map to have uh, a long dimension and. We're going to stretch it out in the y-axis. Y is going to be uh, like your, you know, from one team to the other axis. So let's go ahead and scale this non-uniformly, and I'll stretch it out about like so. It would be nice if there was some kind of directional sense to the map, and I'm going to really cheat in, in like a really horrible way. I'm going to take the little block that usually sits in the middle of my map, and we're going to make it thin, and it'll make it long. And let's see here. Let's just make a duplicate of it. And we'll rotate it 45 degrees. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm probably going to be the only person in the room that finds any kind of humor in this. So bump. And we'll rotate this 90 degrees back. Instant directional map. So at least I can tell which way we're facing. Best map design ever for MOBA, right? It's not one-sided at all. OK, now we need a player start, because that's how we're going to spawn our, our hero. So we'll put this way over here. And this is where we're going to begin. Now, there are some things that we need to even make this work at all. First off, we're going to go under View and jump over to World Properties. This is stuff that you should probably be writing down if you want to do this. So I'm going to try to pace myself so I don't go through it too terribly quickly. Uh, go over to uh, World Info, uh, and we're going to be changing. We're going to add a mini map to this. If I can, we, I think all I have on this machine is MS Paint. So I'm going to try my very best to set up a mini map. If I can't, it's because I don't have Photoshop, and you guys will, I'll, I'll tell you how to go about it. So if you go under My Map Info, you hit the drop down, and if you have installed the MOBA starter kit and rebuilt all of your scripts, 
you will see UDK MOBA map info. And you can expand this, and there's a minimap category. Now, this asks for a minimap texture. The easiest way to get a texture for your minimap is just to take a screenshot. And for simplicity's sake, and so I don't have to jump between a whole bunch of maps, I'm not actually, uh, I'm sorry, through a whole bunch of applications. I'm not actually going to do this. I'm just going to kind of talk to you about it. So what you would do is get a bird's eye view of your map. You could do an orthographic that may be easier in some cases. You want to make sure that the y-axis is pointed upward. That's the important thing. So when you're doing this on your own, make sure y points up. Of course, you wanted to take this into Photoshop and make it look a little more orthographic, you could. Or if you wanted to switch this out to, say, a do, 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 a top camera. Of course, that comes with its own sort of headaches. I would probably just do a perspective cam and you know tweak it out in Photoshop. The catch is your final screenshot, like anything you bring into Unreal, uh, needs to be square, and it needs to be a power of 2. Well, the square bit is its own thing, but make sure it is a power of 2. So something like you know 512 by 512 or 1024 by 1024 is going to be perfect. Then, once you've got that, you can add that here into your texture. So boom, and that'll be what your minimap looks like. The only other things you need to set are what is your minimap world center. In this case, it's going to be 0, 0, 0. That is literally where the, the middle of my map is in terms of the coordinates. Then you need to set the world map extent. This is going to be how far out in Unreal units your map extends from that center. That helps the minimap get the appropriate spacing for your characters. Now, I'm going to set this to just an arbitrary value. You would, uh, if you're doing this on your own, you would tweak this. We're going to set it to 4092, and this is really just to help us see some sort of behavior. And we won't have an actual texture there in the minimap, but I've gone over how to go about that, so uh, that's a, a good place for you to start. OK, so now you come under Game Type, and under Default Game Type, make sure you choose UDK MOBA Game Info. Also, only available if you've downloaded and properly installed the starter kit and recompiled all your scripts. So we'll set it there, and we'll also set it in game type for Pi. Beautiful. That's really all we need to do, at least on that end. Now, here's the thing. So I fly back down. By the way, l handy little tip if you didn't know, while you're flying the camera around with right mouse and WSAD, did you know you can use the mouse wheel to speed up and slow down the camera? I'd really be embarrassed if I told you how long it was before I knew that you could do that. So if we go ahead and try playing this right now, we already get some MOBA behavior. So boom, we've got our little demo guy. You can see down in the lower right-hand corner, I have a mini-map. As I move the camera, you can see that camera frustum moving around, and you see a little blue dot that represents my guy. If I had taken a picture of the top-down view of the map with Y up, and if I had dropped that into that texture field, you would see that picture here. But since I don't want to you know, import textures into the content browser and everything right now, we're not going to worry about it. We'll just, we'll just keep rolling. However, I can't make my character move. So this is not very useful. You can make your character move by way of a very special volume. Now, I have done some kind of random scaling here, which is probably a little less than ideal. So what I'm going to do is take my floor, and at least temporarily, I'm just going to nuke it. Let's take the red builder brush. I'm going to right click, and we'll make this something that is real easy. So uh, in X, let's do 2048. In Y, let's do, oh, let's do more than that. Let's do um, 4092. And then this becomes, oh, I can always do 8196 or 8196, I think. Yeah. 8184. I don't remember. I don't care. I'm not very good at that once we get to that level. Doesn't matter. OK, and then uh, let's do 32 units, and we'll build. So I've got a floor. That's perfect. Now, we need to add this to the view. And since I'm a little picky about placement, I'm just going to slide this down. What I'm doing is I'm taking the little move widget, and I'm kind of slapping it right to the bottom of my little arrow wall there. And let's just hit Control A to add this. And that's the best looking floor I've ever seen. But it is going to be a little hard to see what's going on, so we're going to change that. Let me grab um, one of these static meshes that we've got here. Uh, and I'm going to go to Static Mesh Actor. It's just a little quick cheat. We're going to go to uh, Rendering, Materials. And there's the little white material that's been applied. I can click the uh, little Find Object in Content Browser. 
which you can see that just selected that material in the content browser, and just drag and drop that onto the floor. Now everything is white. You might be thinking, why did you just do that? Well, doing it that way was really just a convenience because now my red builder brush is exactly the size of my floor. And the reason that's important is that now I can create a volume. And once again, if you've installed this starter kit properly, you've got the UDK MOBA ground blocking volume. You want that. So now let's move the red builder brush out of the way. And you can just make out this little volume. And in this case, he takes up exactly the same dimensions of the, as the floor, which is going to be pretty convenient. So let's make sure my uh, player start sits right over the floor, because I don't want to spawn my character in midair. I also don't want to spawn him through the floor, so we'll move this up until everybody's happy. Now, that's most of the problem. There's one more thing we need to do. When we right-click, what we're doing is we're creating a navigation point. Our character will only know how to reach that navigation point if we also create a nav mesh for him to navigate upon. So that's real easy to do. We're just going to right click, go to Add Actor, and create a pylon. So easy enough. Now we need to make sure that the entire scope of our level is included within all of our pylons. With a level this simple, uh, we can probably just get away with one as long as we change the properties. So I'm going to hit F4. Go to mesh generation, and let's just crank this up to something a little bit overkill, so like 5,000. That should encompass everything, I think. Notice that our uh, light mass volume is a little bit small. I'm going to fix that real fast. Uh, so uh, let's just non-uniformly scale. That'll just help with light building in a minute. And not super important, but I'm going to do it anyway. So we've got our pylon in place. It should be surrounding most of our level. If it's not, we're going to know here in a minute, so I'm not going to stress too much. Let's go ahead and build our paths. Should take just a moment. And all you want to see here is that your nav mesh goes all throughout your level. And it looks like it does. If for some reason it doesn't, you can kick up your radius or add some more pylons. Uh, if you don't see that mesh, again, you can click the little drop down. You can go over to Show and make sure that you are showing paths or just hit the P key. OK, so now we've got a path. Uh, we've got our blocking volume. Let's give this another test. And here's Demo Guy. And now I can right click, and he's running around, steadily marching his way across. OK, awesome. That's step number one. Uh, now, actually, I think that's like steps one through four. But So uh, now I think the next thing I want to do is add a shop area. We're not going to worry too much about shopping and all that kind of uh, business. But you do need to know about the process for making a shop. And I'm going to begin by adding a meaningful static mesh. Now, fortunately, uh, since UDK already comes with all of the meshes from uh, Epic Citadel and whatnot, I should be able to go under UDK game. And I think if I search for cart, yeah, there's a static mesh of a cart that popped up in Citadel. I'm just going to drag and drop that in. And because I don't ever want people to get confused and not see it, we're going to make it like ridiculously oversized. Because, I mean, you know, when I see an empty wooden cart, I'm thinking it's time to go shopping, right? Now, we're going to put a special volume around this cart. Uh, this is a shop volume. So again, you, you might remember this trick from earlier on. We're going to select our static mesh, and then right click on our cube builder button. And let's do, I don't know, 512 by 512 by 512. Build, but not 51, 512. I can use a keyboard all day long. I only write documentation for a living, right? And let's slide this up. Perfect. Actually, I guess that could be bigger. Uh, so let's make it a little larger than that, because I think I've made my cart so big that we can't stand around it. Actually, no, we're going to shrink the cart. I'm compensating too much there. So let's get that to right about here. That looks good. We just have to be right up on the cart, and everybody should be happy. Now, with my Red Builder brush in place, we're just going to come back over to my volumes. And we'll go to MOBA Shop Area Volume. That means while the player is standing inside this volume, they will effectively be able to shop. And they will get all of their equipment. It'll go to them and not into their stash, etc. We can test that. So let's go ahead and play. And I don't care who we are. So we see our cart. Let's go stand next to it. And my shop button turned yellow. Run away. It goes dim. That's how we know we can go shopping right there.
So definitely cool stuff. OK, so that's now working. Now we need some stuff to try and kill us. So we're going to start off by making a tower. Now, if we go to the content browser and jump over to the actor classes browser, there is an entire new group called uh, MOBA, which has all of the cool things that we can create along with this starter kit. So you'll see uh, there's an ancient objective. This is not complete, so we won't really be bothering with that. We have a creep factory, a creep route, and we have a tower objective. And we could bring in a tower objective and go through a bunch of rigmarole to get it set up. But for sake of ease in terms of our demonstration, we're actually going to use an archetype. If you're unfamiliar with the concept of archetypes, what they are is an actor straight from the actor class's browser that already has a series of settings already set up. And what we do is we save out those settings so that at any point you can grab this archetype and it already has those settings in place. So uh, let's jump over to, uh, I'm trying to make my content browser a little bigger so it's a little easier to read. Under object type, I'm going to go to all types. And we have archetypes. And let's just search for MOBA and see what we get. So we have blue tower, we have red tower, etc. Let's see, what if I just search for tower? Will that narrow things down? Ah, blue tower, red tower, and tower projectile. Perfect. So let's make a red tower right back here. Now, that is the same as bringing in the actor class, but it's got everything already set up and it's good to go. So we can double click this and take a look at its settings. You can see we've got some meshes and some lights and various things set up for it to look really cool. Uh, we've got its damage type. Uh, we've got the amount of damage it deals with every hit. So obviously this guy does 50 damage every time he hits us. We have a detection radius. So if we get within 1024 units, he's going to start hitting us. Something that's really important to keep in mind is we have tower protectors. Now, for my MOBA fans out there, you know that you can't run all the way to you know, the enemy's stronghold and blow that up. You've got to you know, kill the outlying areas first, and then that exposes whatever's in the back. In, in defense of the ancients, that's you know, how you killed the ancients, right? You had to get all the little extra outposts. This is how you set that up, is by way of tower protectors. So if I make a copy, now I'm just alt-dragging out a copy of this guy. Let's jump back to my back tower. I'm going to lock my little properties window here. And we'll add one to tower protectors. We'll select this forward tower and just drop that guy in there. Now, I want to show you how this works. Let's go ahead and test out the level. And we'll be cathode for a minute. Uh, I, think, I feel like I should have made this level a little smaller. OK, so when we get close, he immediately starts attacking. Let's just skip him and start trying to attack this guy. Oh, cannot attack an invulnerable target. But if I come up here to this one, I can start attacking this guy all day long. So you can see how you have that dependency, and you've got to start thinking strategically just like you know, a regular MOBA. Very, very handy. Now, that's only part of the battle. Of course, you want creeps as well. So let's go ahead and I'm going to set up creeps for me, like creeps on my team. Uh, making enemy creeps is just setting the team from 0 to 1. But for time's sake, we're just going to set them up for my team. And here's how we go about that. Let's come over here to our player start. And I'm going to open up the actor class's browser. And we have the UDK MOBA creep factory right here. So we'll just drag one of these in. And it looks like a little chick thing, which, you know, whatever works. It's a great icon, I think. So I'll position that over here near the player start. Now, we have a little bit of setup to do. Let's go ahead and open this up and take a look at its properties. So we have the pawn archetype that we have to establish. Uh, this is just like uh, with the tower. We have an archetype already in place uh, that allows us to control what types of creeps we want to have. Now, for the starter kit, that means we get either uh, the you know buffed UT guy or we get the cathode robot. It's just a question of which one you want to have in here. I do want to point this out. Uh, this is something that will probably frustrate you for five seconds until somebody comes along and tells you about it. But if we come back over here, we're still searching for archetypes. We're going to say creep. And notice we have cathode. Demo guy, and we have creep projectile. If you, I think you can, is it pawn you can search for? Yeah, if you accidentally search for pawn again, you're going to notice some repeated names. Notice there's two cathodes, two demo guys. How to choose the right one is interesting. Mouse over it and take a look at the path. 
Notice this is udkmoba underscore game underscore resources dot creeps. So you could use this one as a creep. If we take a look at the other cathode, this is a hero. This is actually the archetype you use when you're actually playing as cathode. So obviously we want the creeps one. You're probably used to being able to select something in the content browser and clicking your little green arrow. In this case, that doesn't work. Don't stress, though. We're just going to right click. And we are going to say we need to copy that to the clipboard. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Copy, find package, clear custom thumbnail. I feel like I should be able to copy that path directly to my clipboard. And I'm not seeing it all of a sudden. And dragging isn't working. I feel like my brain just melted down right in front of everybody. So let me find the package. And oh, this is probably what's going on right here. I need to fully load. So let's make sure we fully load. Hmm. That's curious. Because I feel like I'm used to being able to copy that entire path, and suddenly I can't do that. Fully load, clear custom thumb, that none of that helps. That's not helping. Still says it's not loaded, which. All right, so bear with me for just a minute. And, hmm. OK, well, hang on. Let me just move on past that, and I'll come back to that here in just a minute. So let me first try setting up my creep root, and then we'll come back over. That's what I'm going to do. So we'll jump back over to my actor classes browser. Now the creep root, it's a little bit involved. We're going to start off by coming over to our actor classes, and we'll drop on a root. Now, when you bring in a creep root, let me make sure I'm not getting a little bit too fast here. So that all I did was just drag a UDK MOBA creep root uh, right into the map. And it looks like a little flag. So all our guys are just going to kind of follow the flag. I will get this figured out, by the way. If it means I've got to take a quick break and then figure it out and come back and show you how I figured it out, we'll get this squared away. No stress. So uh, when you create a MOBA map, generally you have lanes, right? And you need to control how your characters move along the lanes. Now, these creeps are programmed to be pretty dumb. So they're just going to go straight from one flag to another flag to another flag, and so on. So we need to make some sort of path for them to follow. I'm going to hold down Alt and drag out a copy, and hold down Alt and drag out a copy. I'm just going to do this a couple of times just to make something a little interesting. Not too terribly crazy, though. And we'll go from here and run him right over to the tower. Once they finish that tower, we'll run them straight back to the other tower. Now, they are smart enough to know that once they get in proximity of one tower, they will attack that first. And then once that's finally gone, then they'll continue. Now, this is only part of the battle, having your routes in place. We now need to set up an actual navigation route for those to be associated with. So if we take a look under navigation, you'll see root. This is a class that's already, uh, already in UDK. We're just going to drag that in, and we'll leave that really close to our little creep spawner. OK. Now, setting this up takes just a moment. We're going to pull this off to the side, and I'll try to utilize the most of my screen space. The root, we have you know, the different types. Just leave this set to linear. Our root list is going to contain all of these flags in the order we want our creeps to run along them. So uh, if you see, I'm kind of, I have this off to the side. It's really just to make the most of my screen. So let's just hit plus. We'll expand that, and it's asking for an actor. Make sure you lock this view. Otherwise, as you select, of course, the window will update. And we will add in our first flag. And now, how many flags do we have in total? We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Awesome. So we've already added one, so let's just go ahead and add the remainders real quick. So two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And it went through an autosave, so got to hit it one more time. Got to love autosave. OK, so let's get all these expanded, and I'll try to get through this as quick as I can. All right, next actor. So we'll get the next flag and click. And the next flag and click. 
And you actually, you want to make sure that those numbers are incrementing too. So there's creep root one, then two, then three. So they are popping up in a meaningful order. And you can see that line being drawn between them showing you kind of where your creeps are going to go. And another. And one more. And that should be everybody. OK, so that gives us a path for our creeps. Last thing, though, is we need to come back over here to our little creep spawner. He had a special property for his root. So we want to make sure that we select the root that we set up and associate that accordingly. So the, the, the workflow is you create your creep spawner. You create a root, and that root is going to be associated with all of your creep navigation points. OK. Now that only leaves one last thing, is getting that pawn archetype into place. So let's see here. Do, 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 do. Let me get my content browser back over. And OK, not going to lie, feeling kind of dumb right now. It's OK, though. So I'm just going to write this off as dehydration. Um, I've been talking too long, a little delirious. I could be remembering other applications, but what I was trying to do was really just get this archetype, which is right here, plugged into this guy. Now, this has only to do with the, uh, the actual starter kit. There's just a little base level incompatibility that means that when I open up the properties for my little creep factory, I can't use the good old fashioned green arrow to move stuff in. However, I kept thinking that I should be able to right click on this and copy the path over, and I'm not sure where I remembered that from. Maybe I saw it before, maybe I dreamed it. Both things are entirely possible at this time of day. But if you just select one of these and hit Control C, you can come over to the pawn archetype field and hit Control V, and that puts it right in there, like so. So that's really all I needed to do the whole time. If you knew that going in, please, by all means, feel free to send me an email or hit me up on Facebook to get your laughs in, because if I was you, I'd buy me a beer. So uh, moving along, we've got our pawn archetype set up. We've got our root set up. Our root has all of our different uh, navigation points all set. Our team index is set to zero, which is your team, that's the winning team. And uh, maximum creep count is set to 10. That's the maximum number of creeps that this little spawner can have. 10 is such a low and boring number. Let's set that to 100. And then we have a spawn interval. At zero, we're not spawning anything. So let's spawn one a second. So for the first 100 seconds, we're going to get a lot of creeps out of this. Let's get this out of the way. Let's play in the viewport and see what we get. Demo guy. Oh, look, it's making creeps. Let's watch them go. You can actually right click on one of these guys, and your little dude will just fall in line and keep chasing him, which I think that would be like a really easy way to make all of your friends on League of Legends, like everybody on your team or whatever MOBA you're playing, I think that would make them all hate you if you were just following the creeps around. Or maybe they'd love you. I doubt it, but you know. And you can see on my mini-map, I got a little trail of creeps. And they're steadily going to start mobbing the tower. And oh, I'm drawing aggro. And I'll get away before they kill me. Try to get away before, oh, there we go. So you can see them doing their job. Now, I'm going to try to help them real quick, just to show that they will navigate on to the next point. So, let's see. <laughs> give XP. Give me all the XP. All right, that's not much, but let's just use this and I'll kick up my levels real crazy so that as I attack, my attacks actually mean something. There we go. I feel like there should be heroic music playing right now. I need more levels. This guy should already be dead. I'm so impatient. There we go. Awesome. Up oh, and here we go. My ants go marching. Uh, these guys are stuck. OK, well, that's, that's interesting in its own way, and we're not going to stress that too much. Again, starter kit, right? So there we go. Uh, we've got all of the basics of our starter kit in place. Of course, if you were uh, building your own MOBA map, you know, there's all kinds of things you'd want to tweak. This would, again, just be your launch pad. This is where you'd be like, OK, well, my creeps need to work this way. My items need to be more like this. My characters or heroes need to have more abilities, or they need to be treated differently. The leveling is different and unique. And so 
again, the, the point of a starter kit is not just to give you a, a ready to roll game where all you do is jump in and design levels. This is really just to keep you from having to reinvent what is actually a pretty intricate wheel. So with that, we've taken a look at four different games. We had a, a little first-person non-shooter, which uh, that's interesting and off the beaten path, right? Uh, we took a look at the little Jazz Jackrabbit kind of top-down uh, shoot 'em up uh, sort of an isometric style gameplay. Uh, we took a look at the racing starter kit, which will help you get rolling if get rolling uh, if you wanted to make your own racing game. And then we took a look at the MOBA game. Now what I'm going to do is quit talking about actual games for just a minute, and we are going to jump over to mobile optimization for UDK. Now, once again, I've got a little bit of PowerPoint to walk you through, and hopefully you'll find some of this stuff in here useful. Uh, I actually put this PowerPoint together because I thought there's some of this stuff you will probably want to have somewhere in a notebook. Uh, so again, hopefully it's just something you can take with you. So there are some common pitfalls. Oh, here's what we're going to cover. We're going to talk about some common pitfalls facing iOS developers. And whenever I say iOS, if you're just you know if you just want to bang on the Android drum for a minute, I really mean Android too. It's just we all know you can't deploy to Android uh, with off-the-shelf UDK. It's just how it is. Uh, so, so we'll talk about some major performance concerns, how to reduce draw calls entirely within UDK, and then there, I've got an Infinity Blade 2 performance recap. So uh, these are some numbers directly from Chair with you know how they uh, optimized Infinity Blade to run as well as it does, and then we'll talk a little bit about deploying onto iOS. I'm not going to be doing live deployments here on the live stream, and the reason for that is that setting up an actual deployment requires that you go into Apple's uh, provisioning portal, and to do that, you have to be a, a paying member, and uh, you, you basically have to give you know Apple some uh, some money. You've got to sign an NDA, and there's some some stuff back there that I can't put up on a live stream. However, uh, there is I want to mention this early, some UDK documentation available at Epic Games, uh, udn.epicgames.com slash three slash getting started iOS development.html. It's right up there at the, the top of your screen. It's the getting started. Read all of this. Don't skip anything. And there's also another page for iOS provisioning setup. I cannot stress enough not to skip any steps when you go through this. It's real easy to think that you can or that you can jump around a little bit. Don't. Follow this to the letter and you'll be just fine. So with that out of the way, uh, some common pitfalls for iOS uh, deployment are that your iOS device or your mobile device is not a game console. And what I mean by that is you're not going to make Gears of War for it. Uh, you do have to think in a different way when it comes to mobile. Uh, obviously, your game is not going to be as gorgeous as it is on your state-of-the-art PC with your DTX 680 smoking out of the back of it and whatnot. You have a lot of limitations in terms of device memory, and that's one that I do like to make sure everybody keeps in mind at all times. Uh, your newer devices, like your newer iPhones, they all have uh, a gig of RAM. And, uh, or you know, even 512 is actually quite a bit, but a gig is a lot to play with. Uh, the older devices, though, don't have a lot of RAM, and you have to think how far back in terms of compatibility you want to go. But it's also important to remember that you never really have access to all of the physical memory on a device. It's got to run its OS. Uh, it also is probably multitasking. So you got to remember that, uh, again, it goes back to the original point, is that an iOS device is not a gaming console. It's doing other things. Uh, people are answering text messages. They're browsing Facebook. Uh, they're probably browsing Facebook more. And so that's, you know, there, with, between those other two things, there's no other room for a game. Uh, in most cases, memory is going to translate directly to textures and geometry. Now, some performance concerns. One of the big ones you'll hear a lot, and you need to always keep this in mind, are draw calls. A draw call is the number of times the GPU must be called to render your scene. So it's literally saying, hey, GPU, draw this, and then draw this, and then draw this. Now, the number of draw calls is going to be equal to the number of meshes multiplied by the number of materials. And there's some really simple math to help you get started. So one mesh with one material on it is going to be equal to one draw call. Uh, one mesh with three materials is actually three draw calls. So it follows then that you know if you only had 30 meshes, which is not that much, uh, with three different materials on each, that's 90 individual draw calls, and you're starting to really bog down your little mobile device. Now, a PC doesn't care as much about draw calls. Your modern PC graphics card is going to eat draw calls like 
candy, like me eating popcorn at a movie. I mean, just going through it buckets at a time. So uh, on mobile, though, this is a really big concern for performance, and you're going to need to minimize the number of meshes and materials in your scenes. The good news is you can lower draw calls entirely within UDK. And actually, before I even talk a little bit about this, let me jump back over to uh, UDK for just a minute. I want to show you something that hopefully you will find useful. Uh, let's go over to content, mobile. No, I always, I always mess that up. Go to maps and go to mobile. And then go back to Epic Citadel. We don't need to save this. Oh, look, it's our little special version of Citadel. Now, I'm going to fire this up within the mobile previewer. And that's pertinent to what I'm about to show you. You need to be in the mobile previewer to see what I'm about to demonstrate. And that is that you have a special uh, feature, a special diagnostic feature, to allow you to see the renderer that will be used for your mobile rendering. And that's through stat ES2. And this actually shows you, if we take a look, let me bring up the console again. There is your draw calls right there. So currently, this is hitting 96 draw calls. And as I look around, you can see that number increase or decrease based on what's currently in the scene. So if you're wondering, how do I keep track of draw calls? Open up in the mobile previewer. And you can see, once you hit stat ES2, what your draw calls are currently sitting at. That is super mega useful. I also want to point out, though, that if you don't do this in the mobile previewer, so here I am just in the regular uh, standalone. Let's come out here so I can kind of see some stuff. If I do it again, stat ES2, notice everything is at zero. You get nothing. It only works inside the mobile previewer. So definitely uh, worth remembering, because that's an easy one to mess up. So get in the mobile previewer, stat ES2, and you can get immediate feedback on what your draw calls currently are. Mega, mega useful. Can't stress that enough. OK. Back over to our notes. And boom, here we go. So draw calls can be lowered entirely within UDK. I would like to say that this is mostly a convenience feature. You may or may not want to use UDK for this kind of thing. You might want to do some of this using the 3D app of your choice. But your other apps like Max or Maya or, or Blender or whatever, they're not necessary. You can do it. Uh, you can do this entirely in UDK. However, super important, save that kind of optimization until the end of development. There is no point in optimizing a map if you're still working on the map. Because you might be doing like a, a dual release, right? You might have a game that you're building that you want to look really good on a PC. And then you also want it to look as good as it can on mobile. Don't worry about making it work well on mobile until it's already done and looking good on PC. And then you can start downscaling. Static meshes can be combined together to form a single mesh. Here's an interesting little side note, caveat to working on mobile. 40 static meshes at 1,000 polys each is actually going to be slower than one static mesh with 40,000 polygons. That's 40 draw calls versus one draw call. Your phone can eat, or your iOS device, can eat through a 40,000 polygon static mesh reasonably well. Actually, the newer ones can just eat that like nothing. I mean, obviously, you want to test on your target platform. If you're going to put this on an iPhone 3GS, you want to test there. You want to deploy to an iPhone 3GS and see how badly you crash your game. But uh, in your draw calls are the big factor you need to keep in mind. The big example I like to throw out there is if you had a bookshelf. Inside of uh, you know, a PC game, you might be thinking, well, I've got a single static mesh that is a bookshelf. I've got either one static mesh per book, or maybe like one static mesh that's like six books or something. And I just dupe that off x number of times to fill in my bookshelf. So let's say that in the PC, that bookshelf is, I don't know, a couple of dozen objects. That would be a couple of dozen draw calls. For mobile, you'd actually want to take all of those things and combine them into a single mesh, and it would actually be faster in, in that way. Now, Simply Gone, which is included with UDK, allows for static and skeletal meshes to be simplified entirely within UDK. And we're going to take a look at doing that here in just a minute. Now, these are the steps for doing a mesh combine and simplification. So we're going to do uh, select by matching material. Uh, where I could actually talk about all these as a list, or I could just show you in UDK. And I, I feel like it's probably more useful to you uh, to show. I do want to mention this, though. You want to recalculate unique uh, light map UVs. I'm going to show you how to do it. 
I am not going to do it, and I'm just going to call this out. This is generally something that I never do in UDK because I can get far more efficient layouts inside of a 3D package where, you know, because those are actually built to do nice layouts. The fact that you have a tool that does that in UDK is a convenience feature, uh, but I have noticed one or two stability issues. So I'm not actually gonna, gonna do it right here on video, but I do wanna mention it. Okay, so let's jump back over to UDK and we're gonna open up a map that we know is gonna work really well on PC and that's the DM Deck UDK map. So basically this is a map straight out of Unreal Tournament 3. And you've probably seen this in all of its glory. It's a lot of fun to play, but let's say just for sake of example that you wanted to take this and simplify it so that it would run on mobile. You would need to take all of these static meshes. Notice like because it's built like a, you know, your typical Unreal Tournament map, it is really rich in terms of detail. There are just meshes on top of meshes on top of meshes and all of those meshes are draw calls. I can't even run this inside the mobile previewer. It will just flat out explode. So we're not even gonna try. It means I can't show you the number of draw calls, but it would be enough to, to scoff at. What we're gonna do to lower the draw calls, and obviously I can't do this to the entire map, but I can show you the process, is we're going to start taking meshes and combining them where it makes sense. Now, if this is the first time you're doing an optimization like this, you're gut impulse, maybe, well, that's easy, man. We can just take all the meshes and we can combine them under one giganto mesh. And as long as it's under 40,000 polygons, we'll be fine, right? And the answer is, yeah, maybe, probably not, but maybe. You do want to combine meshes, but you want to do it where it makes sense. If you have a mesh that is only going to be, like, say, here in this alcove, you know, you can combine some meshes in here and that'll be great. That'll probably help out quite a bit. But if you had everything as a giganto mesh, then all of this stuff is rendering even when you're way over here someplace else entirely. So what you want to do is you want to combine meshes in areas where it makes the most sense. Uh, so combine them in areas where it's likely that the players can see many of those meshes together. Now also, when combining in this fashion, you need to combine based on matching materials. Now that's an interesting concept to consider real quick. So we can't take, for example, this mesh, which let me get out of game mode so you can see what I'm selecting. So we can't, we can't take this mesh and combine it with this mesh because they have two separate materials. However, if we wanted to make the most out of our mobile optimization, if it were possible, uh, we would probably want to start combining our textures for those materials into larger texture atlases so that we ha actually have fewer textures and make the most out of that texture space. So, you know, where this actually does have two materials, if you were clever with your texturing and you made some texture atlases, you could probably make this uh, such that both of those materials were all in one material and then you can start combining stuff like this. But that's a little, that's kind of like one half step beyond the scope that I'm going to be going into here. I wanted to mention it for those of you who are uh, kind of you know, ready to start thinking one step beyond what I'm discussing here. Okay, so let's say I want to combine some meshes and they have to have the same material. Easy way to do that is to select a mesh, right click, we can go to select, and we can select by matching material, which is always right there in front of me. So there you go, select all with matching material. Boom. Now this is selected every mesh that has that material. There is a caveat to working this way. If that material has been applied to any BSP surfaces, you must deselect those surfaces before going any further. Now, if you, if you, you know, don't want to have to dig through manually, there are some tricks you can use. So here I am in the content browser. We're going to go over to my layers browser, and I'm going to add a brand new layer. And I'm going to name this underscore first, so it'll kind of be up toward the top. Well, it's, you know, that's optional. Maybe Z's, so it'll be down at the bottom. So Z, OPT for optimize, and we'll call this girders underscore one in case there's any other kind of girder that I ever want to combine together. Now, ideally, you would go through and you would do this to all of your meshes. You'd put them all into a whole bunch of layers. For time's sake, we're not going to do that. There are a lot of layers in here. So if I can blink and turn those on and off by hitting my little checkbox. And we can see all of the meshes that exist in here. If anything other than a static mesh got added, you would want to make sure that that got removed, basically. You wouldn't want that in your layer because you don't want to accidentally try to combine that. You can break stuff. 
All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide everything else. Now, all these layers were here with the map. These were what the designers used to make sure they stayed on top of everything. And really, I think almost everything is just in the none group or none layer. We can also hit Alt-Q, and we can hide our BSP. So now there's really nothing showing until I turn those girders back on. So now here's all those objects. And you can see where this would become useful, right? Because uh, you can go through mesh by mesh and start making these intelligent groups of everything that has the same material. Super easy to do. Now, I want to make a nice selection of meshes that make sense. It'll probably be easier to kind of just leave my BSP on, and I'm just going to fly around to some area where it looks like I can start grouping stuff. And actually, this looks like a fairly nice spot. So I, if we were walking around in here, and let me just turn on none for just a second. So here you go. Here's an area where you know the player would be able to see you know just what you right in here and then as they move out of here they would be looking at some other meshes so I'm thinking basically the girders right here in this corner are prime candidates to be combined so that would basically include let me get out of game mode and let me hide my uh, my BSP again that's alt Q to show and hide your BSP so basically that would include all of these meshes So I'm going off the, the working premise that if a character is standing right about here, they could see all these at the same time, and we could go ahead and start combining these. Now here's how the combining process works. First, we're going to export them out. Let me go ahead and get rid of our layers uh, browser. We don't really need that right now. I'm going to go to right click and choose Export FBX. Now it's going to automatically want to stick these in your content folder. That's fine, but we're going to make a new folder which we will call optimize and that's just temporary because it makes me happy you can make any you know other folder structure you like in here to you know satisfy yourself we'll call this opt underscore girders underscore one and save now those all just got sent out as a single fbx file now here's the cool thing we're going to bring them right back in now this is easy to get a little bit confused on, so take your time. We're going to hit the import button. Go into our optimize folder. There's our FBX file. Perfect. Open that up. Now, if you're running really fast, so let's go ahead and let's make a, a package. So we'll do a Zach optimize. Of course, you can name that anything. Grouping creeps doesn't really mean anything, so I'll just leave that out. Opt girders one is fine, but make sure, please make sure that you come down and under the static mesh category, check combine meshes. That brings all these in as a single static mesh, which is exactly what we're going for. So we'll go ahead and click OK. Give that a moment to come in, and there we go. So here is our mesh. Now, it has no collision. I'll just throw a quick word out there. You're probably better off not worrying about adding static mesh collision. Add blocking volumes where you need them. So if you need to stop a player while they're moving around, just throw in some blocking volumes and keep it simple like that. They're going to be faster. OK, now we need to get a material applied to this. Here's how I'm going to do this. Here's our new mesh. We're going to double click and open it up in the static mesh browser. Or static mesh editor, excuse me. It's not a browser. Then we're going to take our little girder here, the ones that already exist, right click, find in content browser, open up this one in the static mesh editor as well. So I have two static mesh editors open. Let's get the content browser out of the way. All I want you to see are these two static mesh editors side by side. Now we have LOD info. This is where the material hides. So let's go over to our original one and we'll expand its LOD info. We'll find its material. And there you go, find in content browser. And just to swoop in my content browser, now we have that material selected. Awesome. Let's get the content browser kind of off to the side. Now on our new one, expand LOD info, expand, expand, expand again. And we can drop that same material right back in, and everything just plain works. The material is immediately applied. So that's pretty awesome, and it saves us some time and effort. Now let's close out this, close out this. Actually, I do need the content browser up, so I got a little close happy there. So let's go back over to my uh, Zach Optimize group. And you can see 
There's our mesh. It's got its material on it. You saw it turn brown. Now here's where it gets cool. We've already taken care of all of these meshes. We've combined them, so we're going to delete them now. We no longer need them in the scene. Boom, 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 boom. Awesome. Now, we bring in our new mesh, and we can't see it at first. Don't panic. This is one of those things where it's like, oh, it didn't work. I should drag it in seven more times. Don't. It's there. It's just floating out in space. The reason it's floating out in space is actually because when we dropped this in, I'm sorry, when we exported it out, that's what I meant to say. When we exported this out, it exported relative to the origin of our scene, or 000. So to put it back where it belongs, we just open up its properties, and we can go under movement, location, and we'll do 0, 0, 0, enter, and it goes right back to where it was. Now it's just one mesh. There are a couple of considerations at this stage before we do anything else. First off, we can make this a much lighter object. Currently, this is 5,400 triangles. Uh, if I double click my object and open it up here in the static mesh editor, we can simplify that because of Simply Gone. It's pretty easy to do. We can take our simplification type and we can leave that at max deviation or we can just go straight by the numbers. So I'm going to go by a number of triangles because it's pretty easy. We have three different settings. We have silhouette, texture, and shading. Silhouette is going to try to maintain the silhouette shape of your model. Uh, the higher you set this value, the more triangles or more detail you're going to retain because it's fighting, the algorithm is actually fighting harder to maintain the shape of your object. Texture, same thing, but with your actual texturing panel. So your UVs are going to be tried to, it's going to try to maintain your UVs as best it possibly can. And then shading is going to try to maintain shader quality. And the higher you have that, then also you're, you're basically saying, all right, keep triangles as long as it, it shades more properly. We're going to leave everything at normal. And we're going to take our little slider and just pull it down to about 50%. So currently we're starting at 5,400 triangles. Uh, we're going to leave all the repair options at default and click Simplify LOD0. And boom, we go from 5,400 straight down to 2,700. So half as many. And if you, if you look at it, it really doesn't look all that different. Yes, there are some gaps here. And if you look really close, it's not as detailed. But this is where you get to make those you know, artistic trade-offs. This is going to be a much more efficient mesh. So uh, you know, how far down are you willing to go before you lose enough quality? If I pull this down to 20% and simplify again, now we might be getting a little problematic. We've lost a lot of the cross pieces. It's really starting to fall apart. But that's cool. It's non-destructive. We can bring it right back up to, let's try splitting the difference. Let's try somewhere around 40. That's not bad. I mean, and you got to think. In the type of game you're making, how likely is it that people are going to notice the errors? So if you're making like a fast-paced racer, you know, something like, you know, remember the old Wipeout series where you're just zipping through all these sci-fi tunnels and everything's just like crazy top speed? Do you really care how perfectly detailed all the pipes are that you're zipping by at 200 miles an hour? Probably not. But if it's something, you know, like a murder mystery, slow-paced game, you might need a little more detail in your meshes. So keep trade-offs like that in mind at all times. I'm going to pull this back up to about 50% and simplify. And that looks pretty good. Now, the other thing is because we exported this out and then brought it back in, our light map is destroyed. So if you didn't know, uh, models tend to have two different UV channels. On the one, the first UV channel, that's where all of the UV tiles can overlap so that you can repeat textures. For instance, actually, we can show this off uh, to a certain degree. If we go under View and we turn on UV Overlay, so now, right now we're looking at UV channel 1. Let's take a look at 0. So here's where we're actually applying our texture. And there are a lot of, of panels of UVs that are overlapping. All that means is you're reusing texture in different areas. So that's why you can see like the same texture here, and then the same texture here, and the same texture over here. When you overlay your UVs, you're just you know, repeating that texture data. However, there's a second UV channel and this is taking every single face and laying it out uniquely so that you can get nice, clean shadow maps. Now, this layout that you see here was perfectly fine when all we had was one girder. But now we have several of them all on top of each other. That means all of these girders are using this shadow map. And that, that's going to mean where one girder has a shadow that runs right across the center, they all have to have it across the center. And those shadows will keep overriding. You'll just end up with garbage. Basically, long story short, this is bad, and you don't want this. 
you can fix this in Unreal. There is a tool for it. Uh, so if we uh, go under our uh, view, so we've got our, our overlay. We have generate unique UVs. And if you take a look down here in the lower right hand corner, generally for what we're doing here, you would, you can do it. I have done it, and I have made the editor explode a couple of times by doing it too many times back to back. Uh, but if we keep our existing charts, uh, because we already have uh, the appropriate number of UV shells, the problem is they're just all stacked on top of each other. So we can keep the data that's there and then apply this. And all it's going to do is basically unstack all of those and lay them all out uniquely again. And it will work most of the time. And I'm not trying to say that you know it's a serious problem. Because honestly, when I'm doing stuff like this, I, I don't rely on Unreal at all. I'm usually very picky, and I handle this stuff inside of something like Blender or 3ds Max, because those are tools that are specifically geared for the purpose. And they give me a lot more ability to take my UVs and actually customize them a little bit. Because I trust algorithms only so far as I can throw them most of the time. So I'll often want to go in and maybe tweak my UVs a little bit manually. And for that, you need a digital content creation package. So. Again, it will work. If it ever crashes, make sure you're saving your work. And I don't want to really harp on that too much harder. OK, so at this point, you have optimized a mesh. So let's go back over to our layers. And we'll turn some stuff back on. In fact, let's just turn everything on. And my layers window is off camera. So instead of irritating people with that, let me go to a nice view. I'll go into game mode. We'll start turning stuff on. And you should just start seeing things magically appear as I click over and over and over and over and over again. Butamus. Now, here's the deal. You would want to take what I just did and keep doing it over and over and over all throughout your level. And don't expect that to be a really quick process. Uh, optimization takes a while if you're going to do it right. So let's jump back over to our notes. So there's everything that we just went through. So just as a review, we uh, put stuff into a layer. We hit everything else, grab meshes that make sense, You know, stuff that would be in a relatively localized area, export all those out as FBX, re-import as a single mesh, and reapply the material we simplified with SimpliGon. And then we, have, we can optionally uh, recalculate our unique UVs. So some other considerations. IOS, or your, uh, your device, actually, uh, can handle meshes to the order of 40 to 50,000 polygons at a time. So one mesh can have 40 to 50,000 polygons. That's really good. And it, it's, it's getting bigger all the time, right? Because devices are getting more and more powerful all the time. Uh, it is more efficient to have large meshes with tens of thousands of polys than, um, than many meshes with low poly numbers. And there's my typo that everybody can point out and yell at. IOS does not allow for masked materials. So uh, consider a chain link fence. And this is for those of you out there who've been playing with materials. If you don't know what I'm talking about, make a note. And later on, when you play to them, you'll come back and be like, huh, now I know what he's talking about. So a mask material is really just a material where you have binary visibility, um, either on or off. So picture a material of a chain link fence, right? The holes in between the chain links would generally be, uh, uh, they would be invisible. So you'd have binary invisibility right there. It's not like it would fade out, right? It's a definite cutoff where you can see the wire, and then you can't see the gaps in between. You can't use those in, uh, on mobile. So it, they're just not supported. So you can use translucent instead, and you know just make sure that your translucency map, or whatever, I'm sorry, your opacity map is really blatant and doesn't have a lot of fading. But you need to use these really sparingly, because overdraw is a big issue. And uh, when I say overdraw, I mean when you have one object and you're drawing it on top of another object. And well, you know, one is transparent, so you have like a sheet of glass and you're looking through. That is expensive to draw, and you need to use it as little as you can. And in some cases, geometry may be a cheaper route to go. So let's say you wanted to make a chain link fence. It would probably be cheaper, because you could have things that are like 40 to 50,000 polygons. Uh, make uh, like you know your wire gate, and you can actually have a little polygon strip for each one of the wires, and then another set going in this direction, kind of like a, a lattice, like some people put on their back porches. You could literally do that, and that would work like a chain link fence, and it would probably be uh, cheaper to use than uh, actually creating a translucent material to have the same effect. So, just food for thought there. I also kind of want to point this out, mostly for fun. Let me jump back over to Epic Citadel. So content, back over to, I do it all the time. We need to go to maps first and then mobile. That's OK. I don't have memory problems, like at all. 
I'm the best at memory problems. Okay, so if we take a look at the cathedral, and we go inside the cathedral, most of you probably remember the absolutely glorious reflective floor in here. It's amazing. But if we get out of game mode for just a minute, and excuse me, so we jump out of game mode. There's something curious going on here. Do you know what it is? This is like one of those you know, visual puzzles where something, one of those things doesn't belong. Take a look here. We have three lights around this to make this happen. And down here, we only have one. That's because we don't have a reflective floor. We actually have a duplicate of the entire scene upside down. And we are looking through a translucent material to give us our final effect. So just a neat trick. Notice it's not really overused. We just do it in this one area. But if you're walking around going like, man, how did they do those awesome real-time reflections? There actually are some reflections in here, but they're not reflecting the way that you think they are. All the pretty obvious stuff is just because we're tricking the audience. And really, at the end of the day, that's, as far as I'm concerned, what most game development is. It's tricking the audience into making them think they saw something that they didn't see. So let's jump back over to my notes. So uh, continuing on, of course, we can't do mass materials. We'll talk about that. Uh, think of the total texture memory used, not individual textures. Uh, condensed textures into atlases. If you can have one texture which represents a whole lot of individual objects, do that. Try to keep those as minimal as you can. Remove any textures you're not using because you're just wasting precious memory, and memory comes at a premium on a mobile device. Now, here's the bit that I find uh, most new users find the most useful. If you had a notebook nearby and you wanted to write down any part of this presentation, this is the part I would recommend you write down. Uh, these are numbers that came directly from Chair uh, regarding Infinity Blade 2 and how they maintained a certain level of optimization. So basically, they're numbers. Because, OK, so if you just learned about draw calls for the first time, you're probably like, yeah, but how many should I have? Well, here's what they did for Infinity Blade 2. So they averaged about 100 draw calls per scene. A little bit of fluctuation there. Less than 100 unique materials for the entire game. That's important because that kept load times really small. When you first fire up uh, any UDK game, this is Infinity Blade or you know, Unreal Engine 3 games, that load time is generally just bringing in your materials. So the fewer materials you have, the faster that's going to be. Faster load times make your game players happy. Most textures are authored at 2048, and then they're scaled down at runtime. So uh, we're basically, it's uh, on-the-fly optimization based on the device that you're, you're using. So really aggressively for like iPad 1 and the old iPhone 3GS, uh, which only have 100 megs of RAM per app. So that means all of your textures need to get really small really quick. So if you were playing Infinity Blade on your iPad 1 like I am sometimes, because I still have one, and you're thinking, this just doesn't look as amazing as I remember on my other iPad, then it wasn't just you. Full resolution for the iPad 4th gen, because that has all of the RAM. Well, I mean, for a, a tablet, it's got a, a gig, which is pretty good. Uh, so now, they, did do, they used LODs on particle systems, which is outside the scope of our discussion here. I can't go into how all this was set up. But it's clever, and I wanted to mention it, because it's food for thought for later on down the road when you all become brilliant developers who are making Unreal Engine 3 games that make you all wealthy beyond the dreams of avarice. And that is that they used LODs on particle systems for performance scaling. So an LOD system on a particle basically means that your particle system gets simpler as you move away. And if you think about it, it makes sense. So let's say you have a particle system of a campfire, right? And a campfire is a lot of things. It's maybe two or three different types of flames. There's like little yellow flames, orange flame. Uh, there's sparks that waver up. There's smoke that comes out. Uh, there's all this great stuff that happens in a campfire. There may be even some heat shimmer, because everybody loves heat shimmer, right? Isn't that like the best effect ever? Now, as you get really far away, and that campfire only takes up maybe a few dozen pixels on your screen, you don't need all of those particles uh, to render. So you lower the LOD to something much, much simpler. So there's less calculation to take place when your fire is really small in the distance. What they did at Infinity Blade is actually use that as a trick so that instead of scaling down your LODs based on how far away you are, scale it down based on the type of device you were using. So if you had an old iPad 1 or an iPhone 3GS, you would get a, a lower LOD, basically a lower version of a particle system, or it would kill off the particle system entirely if you just couldn't handle it. But in, in most cases, you would get a particle system that was simple enough to just be one draw call, and that saved a lot of hassle. And that was actually something that they fought with a lot, was getting particle systems not to completely kill their game. So that is basically my entire presentation 
uh, for today in terms of mobile gaming. So we've taken a look at a series of different mobile games. We've taken a pretty good look at you know some optimization considerations uh, for and just you know as a quick rundown. We talked about draw calls and what they were. Uh, how to keep track of them. So again, that's open up your mobile previewer and type stat ES2, and you can actually see those draw calls. Do that and make sure you move around your level and, and look at it from all these different angles because you know things will look really good for a while, and then you'll look up in the sky with all those meshes you forgot to delete before, and suddenly your draw calls skyrocket, your phone crashes. And, and so make sure you're really testing things out. But that's another point I want to mention as well. Make sure you test. If you're serious about this, you need to be deploying to your iOS device early and do it often. You need to be doing that a lot because using UDK Remote, using the mobile previewer, it's all well and good for making sure that mechanics are functioning the way you might expect, but they have nothing at all to do with performance. So make sure that you are deploying onto your iOS device a lot so that you can track that performance. And so you know, oh, we just added this new part of the level and suddenly our performance has gone just to terribleness. And so you know you now need to revisit that area. The more you test, the more successful you're going to be. I can't stress that enough. So with that, we're going to do a short Q&A. We're actually kind of running a little bit tight on time. so. Uh, this is a time for you guys to throw in any questions you might have. I will answer everything I can. If you ask a question that I can't answer, then uh, I will probably deflect you out to uh, the UDK forums, and we will get back to you as soon as we possibly can. Now, a few of these have already come in, and you'll have to forgive me. I've got to take a look at what's here and see what I got. Uh, so uh, let's see. If I were to make a game and release it in the beta alpha phase, this is from Pixie Payne. By the way, if I butcher usernames, I'm sorry in advance. I'm gonna. Uh, so Pixie Payne says, if I were to make a game and release it in the beta alpha phase, how can I update the game for my players without them needing to download the entire thing again? You know, honestly, off the top of my head, um, I I don't want to say that that's not possible because I would be speaking out of turn. But I'm pretty sure that the update process underneath the hood on an iOS device is doing just that anyway. It's just re-downloading the thing. Um, but you can set your iOS apps to just automatically update. So you know, just like on your phone, you'll see, oh, this requires an update. Here's a list of all the updates. Hit it, and and it's just going to go through that mess. Now it won't have to be uh, completely be deleted. Now the actual setup for that, a little bit outside of our scope. So I would direct you back to the UDK forums, and we'll hit you up as. Uh, as soon as we can. Now, uh, Auto Bottom or Autobot AM, maybe. Uh, so, just out of curiosity, does uh, UE4's GUI use <coughs> as soon as you say UE4? I have to move on. I can't talk about that. Sorry. Next question: Xanatos Four says, <laughs> "Sorry, uh, does UDK support cube map reflections for mobile or transparency uh, by that matter?" So, cube map reflections. I believe there are some cube map reflections, but don't quote me on that. Honestly, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, and I'm not going to try to, I don't want to just give BS answers that aren't entirely accurate. Um, transparency, we already did talk about. So obviously, that's just going to be with a translucent material, but you want to use those really, really sparingly because of the overdraw issue. Uh, so it says, having a horrible time trying to achieve glass in mobile and haven't found any uh, useful info around. Uh, glass is going to be a tricky thing to do, especially if you want to have a lot of layers of glass, or, or if you want to really, I mean, if you're looking for glass that also reflects, it may be time for you to start really, you know, considering the trade-offs of the mobile world. I would play with setting up a really simple cube map, but I wouldn't count on that working out very well. I don't, I don't see that working out very well, but I don't feel like I can speak with authority on that, so I'll just be honest. Uh, let's see, next, I have, this is from Jess RO17. Um, I have a project to deploy to iOS. What, I need to, uh, what do I need to do to create a final build for iOS? Okay, uh, we've talked about this a little bit throughout, but just to kind of recap, uh, first off, you need to become an iOS developer. That is going to cost you 99 bucks. That is through Apple. That has nothing to do with Epic Games or anything that we do. Um, Next, if you were completely new, honestly, what I would do is I would recommend that you jump over to UDK and start at the Getting Started iOS development page. 
uh, which the shortcut for that is udn.epicgames.com slash three slash getting started iOS development. And yes, there's some funny casing there, and yes, that's important. So just Google search it, and you'll find it a, a whole lot more quickly. Read all of this. This will get you where you want to go. I also want to point out, uh, if you want to uh, deploy to the App Store so that people can buy your game, you will have to have a Mac device. Uh, you can create all of this on Windows. I'm running Windows right now. I have been running Windows uh, the whole time, uh, and I've actually got my iPad games running on Windows. By the way, if there anybody's still watching, there's something I wanted to show earlier, and I didn't show it. So, I know this is, we, I said we were going to go to Q&A, and I know that makes me a liar right now. But, just to show you that you can actually optimize uh, UT to something that is playable. Get a load of this. So this is, I'm going to try to get it really close to the screen so you can see. This is Unreal Tournament 3 Bot Match DM Deck playing on an iPad. And you'll see it's actually running pretty beautifully. So I just wanted to point that out just so that everybody knows that I'm not just blowing hot air. All of this is possible and it does work. Okay, so uh, yeah, start with getting your uh, your development license through Apple, and then jump over to the UDN, read through all of this. It will get you where you need to go uh, from there. So, I think that's all of the questions uh, that that I've got now. Just to kind of jump back, uh, let's see. I'm I'm reading back over anything that I might have missed. So forgive me for just a moment. Yeah, um, so that's all the questions that I have that I can actually comment on. So that's all we've got for today. I want to thank everybody for attending today's live stream. Uh, really excited about uh, continuing these on. If you have any feedback for how this live stream went, please uh, jump over to the UDK forums. I'm sure there's going to be a thread about this live stream and send it there. Uh, we appreciate your support. Please keep rocking and making those games, and we will catch you all on the next Unreal live stream. Until then, take care.